so we're on uh, number notes number nine and um, on page seventy five, and I've you know really been getting to this for a while. Um, this is really the the central part of um, of filter design, and it's called spectral factorization. And at the end of this, we're actually going to design a real filter, and one that you've maybe heard of called the Butterworth filter. Okay, so I don't know. Maybe maybe that's uh, um, I don't know if that's pointless anymore. Um, you know, Butterworth filters are very popular. It's you know uh, they're kind of a uh, uh, you know workhorse filter. They have all these nice uh, characteristics. Um, they're easy. They're quick. Uh, they're causal. They're real. Uh, they're invertible. Um, and uh, you know, maybe that's I don't know. Maybe that's too simple. But my whole objective with this class is to give you a deep understanding of something as fundamental as a Butterworth filter. So that you can say, you know, this Butterworth filter, it's not working for my data sets anymore. I need to go and, and design a, a whole new way of doing filtering. And so if you know how to invent a, a Butterworth filter, then you, you will also know how to invent some new filter uh, or, or new concept of filtering. So that's, that's really what the first half of the class is all about. And, and, and if if you can understand how to how to design a Butterworth filter, and I think um, lab, um, let's see, could be that that lab uh, number three is, has some Butterworth filter questions. Okay, so um, uh, you know I'd be quite happy uh, if the first half of the class uh, just leads you to uh, this understanding. Now the way that the Butterworth filter gets designed is a process called spectral factorization. And all this is is um, taking a desired amplitude response spectrum, you know, some amplitude uh, response for the filter that we want for the filter versus uh, frequency omega, and finding a convolutional filter time series, f of t, uh, that fits our needs. Okay, and now we have um, three ways of doing it. Okay, uh, we can um, use the the um, oh now I've forgotten the name. Um, uh, we can use this uh, uh, Hilbert transform. All right, uh, we take the log of our desired uh, uh, amplitude spectrum, and we um, um, and we take the Hilbert transform of that log, and it uh, assigns basically comes up with the phase spectrum. Okay, so that's uh, one way of doing it. Um, now through the Hilbert transform, that was uh, causal, um, and we had to talk about whether it's minimum phase. Uh, but if you remember the uh, impulse response of the Hilbert transform, um, you know that's a very very uh, uh, long filter that we're going to have. Okay, so you know to to properly accomplish filtering with our you know arbitrary although nowhere non-zero no frequency of our desired amplitude spectrum can can have zero response. Okay. Uh, because we got to take the log of, the, of that amplitude uh, spectrum, right? So it can't be zero anywhere. But um, uh, you know that that um, um, in general um, that that uh, Hilbert transform is going to give us a very long time domain filter to accomplish that that uh, a of omega filter. Um, now, um, uh, 
the BP filter that's uh, uh, implemented, it, you know, with the uh, the class um, with the, with the um, uh, the applied geophysics class. Okay, and so Tyler's used that before. Um, that BP filter is done in the frequency domain, and uh, and the phase, you know, the amplitude spectrum is is applied. The phase spectrum is is left to do whatever it does. And so it's not minimum phase, it's not causal, um, and uh, and we don't even we don't even ever generate the uh, the filter time series, okay? We just inverse transform back, but the phase spectrum is is completely munged and it's it has has all these undesirable characteristics. So um, uh, okay, you know method one. Figuring out how to assign the phase spectrum given our our uh, our amplitude spectrum. Um, there's a uh, a strategy called the bilinear transform, okay, which if you remember from that matrix of um, of pathways that I gave you earlier of different transforms, it, this one goes from a closed form representation in continuous omega okay so you 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 can't just have some desired uh, spectrum you know as a as a spectral series you know as a um, you you've got to you've got to be able to write an equation that uh, that gives you your uh, your desired spectrum okay so continuous omega and then it actually goes to the discrete time domain so that's kind of nice because it's it's direct Right, we we start with an equation for our desired filter spectrum, and and then we uh, we end up with a um, uh, a filter time series directly. Okay, uh, the problem the problem problem with the bilinear transform is that it's an approximation, and it's inaccurate at near the Nyquist frequency. So we'll see that. Uh, the third strategy is called Kolmogorov factorization, okay, and it's it's very nice because it um, it operates from discrete omega, okay. So we can we can you know have a frequency series that that is our amplitude our desired amplitude spectrum, and it goes directly to discrete time, okay. It involves the Hilbert transform, um, and uh, it is. Uh, um, you know where the amplitude spectrum. If our desired amplitude spectrum goes to zero anywhere, uh, then you know it it has to be an approximation. So if if we you know completely want to get rid of of say 60 hertz power line noise, we can't do it. We can take it down to one percent of what it was, but we can't completely get rid of it because nowhere can we have zero response. Okay. Um, it it basically implements causality and it's also fast. So let's investigate the bilinear transform and then uh, talk about Kolmogorov factorization. Okay, so uh, here's our omega definition of z. Right, this is our Fourier definition of z. Z is equal to e to the power of i times omega times delta t. And notice I've, I've put in the the uh, delta t. I'm not assuming it's one anymore, okay? Just to try to um, <clears throat> just to try to uh, 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 make that clear. Now, I said the bilinear transform would start with a closed form expression for um, um, for our desired uh, filter, okay? So. And it's a closed form expression in omega. So I can take this definition of z, I can solve it for omega, right, by taking the log of both sides. So we got omega equal to minus i divided by delta t times log of z. <clears throat> How about that? And, um, and we can now substitute this expression for omega in our desired filter expression. So here's uh, here's a um, let's see this is a uh, band pass filter um, you know it's just a little equation for uh, uh, 
for the filter response in terms of omega, 1 over the quantity 1 plus omega squared. Okay, so you know when we're at, uh, um, let's see, uh, for high frequencies, uh, it's going to have a low response, either positive or negative high frequencies, and it'll have its uh, maximum response at zero, so zero frequency, zero omega. So this is a uh, this is a low pass filter. Okay, very simple low pass filter. Okay. Pretty gentle too. So uh, uh, let's substitute in, right, this uh, bilinear transform definition of of omega. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we have on the denominator one plus one over delta t squared, delta t squared. All right, and the uh, you know minus i squared is one, I think. Yeah. So because um, it's minus one. Minus one times. Uh, let's yeah, see. One yeah, one. yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> uh, and then we have log z squared. Now, um, you're probably thinking, how the heck, you know, I, I got a. This is a. This is supposed to be a z polynomial, right? Okay, and. Um, how, how am I going to how am I going to get the log of z when z is this weird thing, right? You know, first sample is the coefficient of the zeroth power of z and so forth. Okay. Well, if you express the log as a as a Taylor series, right? Write out the log as a Taylor series, then um, then you can do this. So you've got this infinite series on the denominator, right? And then you divide the polynomial one by that, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get a very, very long, you know, it's like a doubly long, um, uh, doubly infinite uh, uh, series here. Okay. But, you know, we could write it down. All right. Um, all right. So, so let's, let's avoid the, uh, let's avoid the infinite series. <clears throat> so, so let's go back to the definite, the Fourier definition of Z. We have Z equal to E to the I omega delta T. And uh, let's let's kind of um, uh, you know factor it, okay? So we've got e to the i e to the positive i omega delta t divided by two, okay? Uh, and that's all in the exponent, right? That's that's all the exponent, and that's divided by e to the minus i omega delta t over two, right? Um, and now here's the bilinear approximation. We're going to use a Taylor series to expand each one. Okay, and we'll get we'll get a definition of of z. Okay, so uh, um, we have one you know one plus i omega delta t over two plus uh, I think it's going to be or it's going to be minus uh, omega squared delta t squared over four you know that sort of thing. So that's uh, <clears throat> you know that'll that'll keep going and on the on the bottom right we expand this exponential into a Taylor series. You know, one minus, and the first, the next term is i omega delta t over two. Okay. So, so okay. Here's the approximation part. Let's just take these two first terms on the numerator and on the denominator, on the top and bottom. Okay. So here's the definition of the bilinear transform. Z is equal to um, is is approximated. Z is approximated by one plus i omega delta t over two. And on the bottom, one minus i omega delta t over two. So we got, uh, you know, essentially a, just one complex number divided by another, right? Um, and so we uh, we can solve this for uh, minus i omega, okay, uh, easily enough. And that's uh, uh, again, it's an approximation. It's two over delta t times one minus z over one plus z. So each Wherever we see a minus i omega in our um, in our closed form desired spectrum, okay, we substitute this z polynomial, which at least it's you know there's a there's a denominator here in this z polynomial, but but at least it's um, it's only got two terms in the denominator. There aren't infinite terms in the denominator, so that's uh, somewhat easier. Okay. 
So what is the bilinear transform going to do? We're going to take a closed form expression for a desired spectrum in continuous omega, and it transforms it to the z domain, you know, into this rational filter. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, um, another another thing that happens here is that if you take some um, some f of omega, right, in 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 continuous omega, you could end up with a filter that does aliasing, right? Because you know, in continuous omega, the uh, uh, the filter is described at frequencies way above your Nyquist frequency. It's described up to infinite frequency, right? And so that could, that could be a problem right there. Okay, but because you know we only we we take it directly to z. I mean, this is because we cut off you know all these all these other terms here got cut off. So that's that's removed the potential for aliasing, right? Because we always you know it's only it's only going to be powers of z that are that are in here. So aliasing is is taken care of. Okay. The filter we we end up with is guaranteed to be non-aliasing. Um, now, let's examine how this bilinear transform is an approximation. And what I um, the way I'll I'll examine this is I'll take a a z plane, right? So here's here's some points in the z plane, and these are you know these are significant points. Um, you know, we might and we might wonder where uh, uh, where each of them goes, okay? And on the left is the exact uh, representation, and on the right is the bilinear approximation, right? So there's the there's the z the uh, Fourier definition of z basically solve for i omega, and here's uh, here's the uh, the bilinear approximation. You know, uh, now notice that I put omega hat over here. Because once we've made the bilinear approximation, we've cut off these terms here um, in, in the process of solving for omega. Okay, Once we cut off those terms, really what I'm getting here, and that's why I have an omega hat, this is going to be an approximated frequency. Okay, So that's one way of looking at the, the kind of accuracy. How, how different is, is this approximated omega hat from the the real omega that we wanted, you know, where where is the difference? So, uh, okay, we got a unit circle here in the uh, in the z plane. We start at um, point A is at zero frequency and on the on the unit circle. B is at at uh, half the Nyquist frequency. C is at the Nyquist frequency. D is at minus half the Ny Nyquist frequency. E is at the origin. I mean, that's a point we've got to watch out for, right? Because that's uh, that's kind of a disastrous point. And F is is where we might, you know, that's a that's a, that's where we put a lot of our, uh, you know, very naturally put a lot of our poles and zeros, you know. So it might be good to see where where that lands. <clears throat> okay. So so here, you know, we we um, we take uh, Z here. And the exact representation we we get i omega, and um, and uh, um, you know here we take z and we we put it through the uh, the bilinear approximation and we get uh, i omega hat, and so and, and these are both um, complex omegas. So I should have made them red, right? Should have made them red. Complex omegas, both of them. Um, so uh, there's uh, you know imaginary omega pointing up positively, real omega pointing to the right, and there's this real omega hat, imaginary omega hat, um, and then this blue line here is to remind you that in z plane, that's the quadrant you're looking at. You know, so you, you might care most about about you know how things are are scrambled when you're. Um, when you're uh, in the uh, in that blue quadrant, okay. Um, so at zero frequency, right, point A, zero frequency on the unit circle, right. You put it through the exact one, you get it right at the, uh, uh, you know, right at zero real, zero imaginary um, 
uh, omega. Okay, and you put it through the the uh, bilinear transform, same spot. Okay, so that's that's not an approximation. That's 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 accurate. Okay, um, let's go up to um, uh, let's stay on the unit circle and go up to uh, uh, pi over two. Okay, and and you know it's on the the real omega axis and it's at uh, it's at uh, pi over two as it should be. Okay. Um, and where does it end up in the bilinear transform? It ends up not at pi over two, but at two, right? So pi over two is uh, uh, 1.5, 1.6, okay? And, um, and, and so the bilinear transform, uh, you know, we wanted to put it at, at, uh, at pi over two, but it's ending up, you know, at 25% higher frequency. So there's like this frequency shift. And that's how it's an approximation. Okay, come back down to the real axis at point C. Okay, uh, that's at pi, and um, uh, in the bilinear transform, um, we can't get there. You know, C ends up being at infinite frequency. So, so it's it's uh, you know, woe is us if we hit the. Uh, you know, if, if we're trying to do something near the Nyquist frequency with our with our filter developed from a bilinear transform, uh, it's not going to work as expected because it's it's uh, it's going to you know it's going to be manipulating frequencies way beyond the Nyquist, which means it won't be doing anything like what we want it to do. Okay, so it's getting increasingly inaccurate up up near the Nyquist frequency. Uh, D okay uh, minus pi over two. And in the bilinear transform minus two. Okay. Um, what about this dangerous point E? Right. That's up there. At, you know, that's going to blow up the whole thing. That's up there at um, uh, on the imaginary positive omega axis, and it's at uh, um, uh, and it's it's up here at two i. Okay. And um, Let's see. Uh, F is um, is down here on the you know at, at negative imaginary uh, omega, and it's at minus two i uh, on um, after bilinear transform. So that's not too bad. Um, let's see. Uh, and F is a point we're going to use uh, a lot, and you know it's going to be pretty. It's going to be accurately placed at at um, you know zero frequency. Uh, okay, so so that's the uh, you know this illustrates the main problem with the bilinear transform that uh, we we can't really uh, we can't really manipulate the uh, the Nyquist frequency very well. The higher frequencies, you know, we're going to have a lot of problems at. Okay, uh, now there's a uh, frequency you know in the in the accurate in the exact one. There's this non-uniqueness because where are we on the unit circle? Okay, you know we're winding around, and uh, you know we could be at uh, infinitely high frequency, um, and uh, uh, you know we could be here. Is that pi over two? Is it is it five pi over two or what? You know we don't know. We have, the, we have that winding number problem. One nice thing about the bilinear approximation is it's unique. Any uh, you know any omega here has a separate point. Okay, so if we keep winding around, right? We we already can't get to C. That's out at infinite. Well, that's a very separate point, right? So we we um, you know there's no problem. We if, we we can't even get to C, let alone go around another time. So it's, it's just. Uh, uh, you know, there's no winding number, number problem. We're we're only within the principal fold because we can't even get to C. Okay, so uh, we can't we can't get to the Nyquist frequency. Um, so uh, uh, there's a nice one to one relationship there. What else happens? It's going to turn out the transform is minimum phase. Okay, which has a lot of nice properties. It's causal. It has a causal inverse. Okay, very nice. 
uh, let's look at this this frequency accuracy problem, okay? Versus uh, you know, say the Nyquist frequency. All right. <clears throat> um, so here's the bilinear approximation minus i omega hat is equal to two over delta t um, times uh, one minus z divided by one plus z. Okay, so uh, we'll start clearing that, and um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna trickily uh, 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 divide the numerator and the denominator by by square root of z. Okay, and um, and then uh, um, I can uh, uh, I can I can use a trig identity in here to uh, uh, resolve that. And uh, so I end up with minus i um, sine omega delta t over two divided by cosine omega delta t over two, which means that, um, uh, uh, and then uh, you know I put the tangent in there. So I have the approximated frequency omega hat in green times delta t over two is equal to the tangent of the real frequency omega with no green. Uh, times delta t over two. So, so um, you know, if you make a, a a plot of omega hat versus omega, right? The uh, the tangent the tangent goes uh, infinite at, at pi, right? It's this this tangent is not cyclic, right? It's it's uh, and, and in fact, you know, on, at negative frequencies, it does it does the mirror image, it goes infinite. Negatively infinite at uh, minus pi, so um, you know, um, and the tan the the angle of the tangent here is forty five degrees, and and that's the same as the exact one, right? So if it was exact, it would be at forty five degrees, and at near zero frequency, it's pretty good, and you get past you know half the Nyquist, and it's diverging pretty quickly. Okay, so you know we. Um, uh, we try to filter here just for the Nyquist, and we end up filtering at some apparently uh, outrageously high frequency. Okay, so uh, uh, we uh, um, uh, that's that's uh, that's the problem. If we really want to filter at the Nyquist, then we're gonna then we're gonna we're gonna design in a filter at you know like three quarter Nyquist because that'll filter at the Nyquist. So uh, okay, here's our here's our low pass filter, right? One plus one, uh, one over one plus omega squared. So kind of looks like that. And um, uh, you know what happens at the very high frequencies, right? In the continuous form, you know we're gonna go, we're, we would go beyond aliasing. Now I need to factor one plus omega. I need to factor omega squared to identify i omega, right? So that's just uh, and and factoring uh, uh, you know factoring things into factors that involve i is a trick that you'll uh, you'll use again, okay, right? So if you multiply these two, you'll get omega squared, okay? So we factored omega squared into i omega times minus i omega, right? So we got one plus that, and now we got i omega in there. We can transform, okay? So there's the bilinear transform. In that i omega, and here it is in this in the second i omega with the minus sign, and uh, you know we try to clear the fractions, okay, um, and um, um, this is one disadvantage of the bilinear transform, right? You got to do some algebra here, and okay, we've got codes now that can do algebra, you know, like MATLAB or or Mathematica, but uh, you know. Um, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to feed a computer, um, you know, some desired uh, filter response, and then and then um, have the computer do the algebra, you know. That's like a that's like the engineering design step. So that you know, there's always this human intervention needed here. Um, okay, so so we multiply both you know the numerator and denominator by uh, one plus z, and we can clear it this far. So we have um, uh, this approximated f of z is now this rational filter minus one plus z squared in the numerator, and 
uh, in the denominator we have uh, z minus uh, one third and z minus three. Okay, so let's figure out where the poles and zeros are. Right here we've got uh, in the numerator we got zeros at uh, minus one. Right, because that goes to zero. That polynomial goes to zero at minus one. So there's a double zero there. And here's a pole at uh, one third and a pole at three. Okay, pole at one third, pole at three. Now, of course, this pole is inside the unit circle. It's a it's a terrible instability, right? Now, uh, um, um, you know the the problem with this uh, uh, symmetrical. Um, uh, desired uh, filter spectrum was that uh, you know it looks simple, but actually this symmetrical filter, you know, the same at positive and negative frequencies guarantees non-causality uh, once you once you take it to a uh, um, once you take it to a um, a time series. So um, uh, that's why we have this this instability. All right, so, but. Remember that that if we if we move a, a pole or a zero to its polar reciprocal location, right? So we we move this this pole at one third. We move it to three. Okay, that's a polar reciprocal location. Okay, and that is going to be, um, uh, you know, that, then we have a pole outside, you know, well outside the unit circle. That's going to be fine. No problem. Okay, so we just double the pole at three, we, and we've removed the pole inside the unit circle. Okay, uh, and and you know you, you you make a polar reciprocal change like that, and you don't end up changing the the spectrum that you get, you know, which is now an approximated spectrum, it's not exactly what it was. Um, and so uh, uh, now here's our our new uh, filter. It's uh, our filter uh, polynomial. It's rational. So in the numerator we have minus one plus z squared, and the denominator we have z minus three squared. Okay, and um, uh, so uh, um, uh, you know we could we could implement this is an easy filter to implement using uh, um, recursion, right? There's only uh, there's only you know, a few terms here in, in the denominator, so this is a really simple filter to uh, to use, um, and it'll have it'll it'll be close to the uh, desired you know simple uh, low pass filter. Uh, and how close are we going to get? Okay, so um, we can uh, um, um, we can substitute uh, omega hat, right? In um, uh, let's see, we have um, um, right. So we can substitute for z, uh, and um, you know we're going to get omega hat is equal to two over delta t tangent of omega delta t over two. Okay. And uh, we can substitute that for uh, for omega into here, okay, into the one over one plus omega squared, all right, and and so there's the uh, the actual response of this filter, okay, and you can see it's got a tangent squared in it and so forth. Um, so uh, actually, this is going to go to um, low response faster than 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 what we. Than the the one than our design filter, okay, uh, because of that that tangent squared in the in the denominator there. So you know we could we could plot this up in Excel or MATLAB and and compare it to one over omega squared, and you'd see just you know how how it was uh, uh, inaccurate. Okay, so that's uh, that's the bilinear transform, and and uh, you know we've developed a filter with it. Um, uh, you end up with a. Uh, uh, you might have to fix up the filter, but you end up with a, a rational filter, um, which you can. Which you can. Um, um, you can make sure the filter is is minimum phase. Okay. Um, 
you know, this filter is not minimum phase because the uh, of the two zeros on the on the unit circle, right? So what would you do to fix that up? You just uh, put them some epsilon outside the unit circle. You know, make it a little more negative than one, and then you would have a perfectly uh, minimum phase filter that you could implement um, with um, uh, with recursion very easily. All right, now to uh, go further and explore um, Kolmogorov factorization, we've got to talk about uh, uh, using a causal series as an exponent. Okay, now that's a weird concept, right? We're gonna, you know, we've done all sorts of weird things with time series, right? We've 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 put them in the in denominators and divided them, you know, as polynomials. Now we're going to take a time series and take its z transform, okay, and we're gonna we're gonna put that we're gonna make that an exponent, okay? Bizarre, right? But there's an algebraic reason for doing this, and I, I think you know once you get used to the uh, the concept, um, you'll uh, you won't have any trouble with it. So we have a causal filter response, okay. Um, which is a, well, it's a causal time domain filter. It's a wavelet, okay. So it's a causal, causal. Um, you know, it could be a causal seismogram, all right. And so we'll call that C of T. We take it Z transform. We call it capital Z of Z. And uh, we take the omega definition of Z, and we can form um, the uh, the polynomial. Uh, or the Fourier transform C of Z of omega. Okay. Now we can form this exponential. Okay. Let's call it G. All right. I'm not sure why it's called G. Uh, it's a homomorphic transform, but um, we already use H for the Hilbert transform, so maybe that was their next choice. <laughs> Don't want to use I, not even capital I. Um, so g of z is e taken to the power of c of z of omega. Okay. Now remember, um, you know this exponential, right? If you wanted to write it out, if you wanted to solve it and and and, and calculate it, uh, I mean, how would you do it? Well, just with a Taylor series, right? So so that would that would let you, you know, find a z polynomial that would which which would not end. But but you know you could write this exponential out as a Taylor series, and that's how you would actually evaluate it. Okay, those Taylor series they are endlessly useful. Okay, so um, now uh, the assertion here is that you take all right. This is uh, we've taken the exponential of a causal series, and the exponential of that causal series. Uh, you know, notice that this this is a uh, a series in the time in in the in the omega z domain, but there is a time series you know little g of t that's also in there, okay, and and the assertion here is that that is also causal. All right, so let's let's see you know what the heck we're doing here, um, and what this exponential means, and why uh, why for a causal c. Its exponential is also causal. Okay, so we we have the causal C of t, and and we form its z transform, capital C of z. Okay, now th that capital C of z only has terms, okay, that are you know coefficients of you know non-zero uh, coefficients of z to the n, where n is positive or zero. Right, that's what we mean by causal. Right, it's, there's no negative time component, so there's no negative exponents to z, you know, that have any value, that have any any non-zero coefficients. Okay. Uh, so so if you if you think all right, I've got this z polynomial, and and all the powers of z are positive, that means if I square it, right, if I take c squared of it. I multiply that z polynomial by itself. I'm still not going to get any negative coefficients, right? 
so I could I could take it to as high a power as I wanted, you know, keep multiplying out that that z polynomial, and I'm still only going to get positive uh, exponents of z, right? So so um, no matter you know how what power I I how many times I multiply that by itself, uh, I'm still gonna uh, I'm gonna, still going to have a causal time series. Okay, well, all right. You take e to some x. Here's the Taylor series for it: one plus x plus x squared over two plus x to the third power over three. Uh, no, over six. Uh, so it's um, you know x to the nth power over n factorial. Okay, and uh, you know that gets that gets pretty small. That's why the Taylor series is good because uh, it gets uh, the terms get small pretty fast with that factorial in there. Um, okay. So, um, you know, to form the exponential, right, g of z is equal to c to the power, I mean, excuse me, e to the power of c of z, we got 1, plus c of z, plus c squared z over 2, plus c to the third power of z uh, over 6, right? It's c to the nth power of z divided by n factorial. Okay, so... And you know this shows because because there's no way to get a, a negative power of z here, you know this shows that that this exponential is is has got to be causal. Okay, no way to get a ne negative power of z, no way to get any any amplitude before zero time. Okay, so that's a little illustration on on the uh, um, a, a little illustration about about. Uh, Keeping causality through uh, this uh, homomorphic transform of the exponential. Okay, wild, huh? All right. So let's let's um, let's introduce Kolmogorov factorization. So let's uh, let's assume we have the spectrum of a causal wavelet. All right, and 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 our causal wavelet is f of z. Right. So we begin with a causal wavelet, and we take its spectrum. So it's f conjugate of one over z times f of z. Okay, that's equal to the spectrum s of z. Let's also assume that there is no frequency for which the spectrum is equal to zero. Okay, again, you know, it should make sense that to have an invertible filter, we can't make the filter. Um, we can't make the filter, you know, yield zero output at any particular frequency. There's got to be something there to invert, right? So, um, um, okay. So, so our design spectrum here is, uh, uh, you know, and, and and of course, f of z is the, you know, wavelet that represents that design spectrum. Our design spectrum is nowhere zero. Okay. Now, if that's true, then we can find uh, this u. Okay, that's a that's a z polynomial u, which is which will define as the log of s. Okay, we're taking the natural log of a z polynomial. Okay, and and uh, you know we're going to evaluate s around the unit circle, which means we're going to assign frequencies omega. Right, we're just taking the the Fourier definition of z. That that's that's required, you know, to make the log uh, work properly. Got to have that kind of mathematics. Um, now, you know, uh, I'm not going to evaluate that log because here's how I'm going to use it. Okay, so we have um, we're going to say that the the uh, uh, all right the filter. Um, Spectrum, which is f conjugate of one over z times f of z, which is equal to the spectrum s of z, okay, um, is equal to e to the power of the log of s. Okay, we're just you know using the definition of the log there. Okay, or we call it e to the power of u of z. Okay, and um, uh, so what's what's in there? Okay, we've got uh, you know in general, okay, 
you know, this 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 spectrum could be uh, could be symmetric, which means it's going to have it's going to have negative terms, right? So we we factor this this u, um, or divide out this u. This 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 u has a um, it has the causal part, and it has the anti-causal part, right? Um, C conjugate of one over z, that's anti-causal. If C is causal, uh, and all at, at positive uh, times and positive uh, powers of z, then C conjugate of one over z, right? We're inverting the z's here. That's all at negative time. It's totally anti-causal. Okay, it only has amplitude at negative time. Okay, so that means that that you know we've essentially factored this exponential into e to the power of the anti-causal c and e to the power of the causal c. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to allow a uh, a c of z, and at each point on the unit circle, okay, at each frequency, in other words. We have u of z is equal to the log of, of the desired spectrum of z, okay, and that's going to be equal to the uh, uh, the anti-causal part of c plus the causal part of c of of c. Yes, okay. So uh, if we find the uh, the log of s and then we inverse transform to the time domain. We've got a symmetric function, okay? Because we took it out of the spectrum here, right? The log of the spectrum gives us a symmetric function, so it's got the causal part and the anti-causal part, okay? Uh, but uh, you know, once we have the symmetric function, we want a causal function. All we have to do is just force those anti-causal parts, the the coefficients at negative time, at negative powers of z. We just force them to zero. Right, we can do that, okay, and that leaves us a, a c of t and a c of z, right? Then we take our our filter is e is equal to e to the a power of c of z, okay, and then you know because um, because the uh, 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 because uh, it's a homomorphic transform that uh, is going to retain causality, that means f is going to be causal. You know, we made C causal, uh, and so F is going to be causal as well. Uh, another question, is F minimum phase? Okay. Um, we could also construct the, uh, uh, we could also construct E to the minus C of Z, right? And that's causal as well. All right. So, so this is the inverse, uh, and it, but it's still causal. Okay. So, so you know, being if g is the inverse, g times f is going to be equal to the polynomial one, right? Just just like this ought to work, right? As an exponential. So uh, uh, that means uh, that g is the inverse, and the inverse is causal. Okay. Now uh, here's uh, here's something from our statements about uh, minimum phase. A causal wavelet is minimum phase if and only if you know, one-to-one -one correspondence, its inverse is causal. So we've made a causal wavelet, and it has a causal inverse. Or we could construct a causal inverse, all right? But it has a causal inverse. So, therefore, f is minimum phase, OK? Uh, you know, all right, so we got our, we got our desired spectrum, OK? And essentially, you know, we're going to take its, uh, uh, we're going to remove the, um, uh, we take it to a time series. We remove the the anti-causal part, and then we take the exponential. Okay. Um, now, what if our desired spectrum and, and this spectrum right is in is in it's not a continuous frequency. It's in um, uh, it, it's in sampled frequency. So there could be you know maybe this is the output of some data. You know it's it's. We take our desired spectrum from the data, and what if what if the spectrum is zero for some uh, omega? Okay, now Clairbout approximates that with a very small minimum value. You know, maybe taking instead of zero, he takes it to like ten to the minus thirtieth, 
which is about the smallest value you can have uh, in single precision floating point. Um, I think that's too small. It, you know, it'll it'll cross into under underflow too easily. You know, so I, I might even instead of zero, I might even make it you know as big as one percent. You know, I'd I'd have to look at the spectrum to uh, to decide, but I I wouldn't make it quite that small. Um, now uh, this all looks very mysterious right now, but actually. It's it's relatively easy to write a program that will do this uh, uh, Kolmogorov factorization, okay, and 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 notice it's factorization because we're 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 getting this factor out and we're zeroing out this factor, right? So we're just like taking this factor here, uh, the causal part. So uh, that's how it's factorization. Um, in the book, Clairbout gives you a very simple program. Uh, it might be twenty lines. In Fortran, I mean, as as I've implemented it in Java, much bigger, but um, uh, but really quite simple. And um, and so the theory behind it is this weird algebra, right? But uh, um, you know, we'll see in, in 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 developing the Butterworth filter, we'll see an example of how to actually go through that, and that'll give you the program.